show today. I'm excited to be joined by Dr. Derek Todd, who is a practicing rheumatologist at the Brigham and Women's Hospital up in Massachusetts, associated with the Harvard Medical School. So welcome, Dr. Todd. Well, thank you for this opportunity. Sure. How are you this morning? Very good. Thank you. So we're going to be talking about childhood onset arthritis, which is, can be a chronic condition for many juveniles, and it affects approximately 300,000 children and their families in the United States. So I wanted to find out from you more about the signs and symptoms of childhood arthritis and how parents would be aware that they, something could be going on with their kids and why they might want to take their child to the doctor to be evaluated. Sure thing. So uh, the current medical term is juvenile idiopathic arthritis, and idiopathic is an unfortunate bit of medical jargon, but it basically means that doctors don't know the cause of this condition. So uh, JIA is one of the more common types of arthritis that affect kids, and it's sometimes surprising to think about arthritis affecting kids, but it does. And it might first come to uh, show up as an unexplained limp in a child or a kid who's three or four years old who's been walking and running and then suddenly stops walking and starts crawling around on the ground. And pain is often present, but not always. And kids don't always know how to express pain. And um, that's usually the starting point. They may have fevers or other systemic symptoms that make them ill and sometimes land them in the hospital. Okay, so would it be sometimes a gradual onset of these things that would lead up to them going into the hospital? And not always. These can show up rather abruptly, but um, the abrupt onset is, does not mean that it doesn't, it might get missed for weeks or months sometimes that a patient has a swollen knee, for example. And uh, only after several orthopedic evaluations, excluding any injuries or infections, that the patient gets referred to a rheumatologist who makes the diagnosis of JIA. And I know for, I know a couple of people that have juvenile onset arthritis mm -hmm. and for one of them in particular it was very difficult for her to get a diagnosis and I think that she was experiencing some pretty severe pain from around the time she was nine years old and it was just tremendously difficult so in the the communities like in our community hospitals or community doctor settings is it something that they see so rarely they have a hard time trying to diagnose or would you say no um, unfortunately, that can be the case. Uh, pediatric rheumatologists are a, quite a rare breed. There's only a few hundred in the whole country, and there's some states that have zero. Uh, really? Yeah, usually, absolutely. They're are, they are usually centered around big teaching hospitals in the cities. And so even rather large communities cannot have a, can, can lack a pedi pediatric rheumatologist. And for that reason, a number of adult rheumatologists have uh, skill and will see children uh, when this condition comes up. Myself, I'm an adult rheumatologist, but I have, a spe I have a particular interest in adolescent rheumatology. And we have this wonderful clinic at the Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, designed to aid with the transition of children into adulthood. So these kids grow up and they uh, do quite well if they're diagnosed early and treated appropriately. And then they uh, go off to college and maybe they come to Boston and, and you know, they might come to see us at the transition clinic there. Awesome. That would be great because I know that a lot of times when you have a, a childhood disease, it can be difficult transitioning into adulthood because that means that you're probably going out on your own and you really need to know how to be able to manage your own care. So I think that's awesome that you guys have a transitional care program. Yeah. And you just mentioned one of the things that I wanted to touch on next, which is treatment. So what are the current treatments for JIA? Well, the most important thing is first to get a proper diagnosis, and, and often the diagnosis then dictates the treatment. There are a number of different treatments for JIA, and all of these are, as far as medications are, are, are concerned, these are all prescription medications, so patients and their families have to really go through their doctor to get the right treatment. Um, but some of these treatments have been around for a long time and are, can be often scary things like steroids and prednisone which suppress inflammation. It's important to realize that JIA is an autoimmune disorder where the body's immune system is attacking itself. And if the uh, immune system is overactive and causing damage in the joints, it's important to suppress that in inflammation. And so many of these medicines, not just steroids, are designed to suppress the inflammation. Steroids have terrible long-term consequences. So they're not the treatment of choice for any sort of duration of time. 
And so there are a number of different medicines, some of which have been around for decades and others that are relatively new on the market that are very effective, sometimes in combination in treating this. It's about trying to balance the need to treat their condition with trying to reduce and minimize the amount of side effects. And that can be tricky. And what about the pain management as well? Because I know in addition to in the infl trying to reduce the inflammation, mm -hmm. pain can also be a major issue for people with arthritis. So how do you like balance controlling the pain as well as the inflammation and all of that without having people that are, you know, running the risk of becoming addicted to, you know, pain medication? Sure, sure. Well, that's one of the most challenging things that we deal with. Um, pain, it's, pain can arise for a number of different reasons. Patients with JIA can have pain from inflammation itself, and in that case, the treat, treatment of the underlying condition will often help their pain to the point where they can function just as well as they did before the diagnosis. But unfortunately, that doesn't always treat, help everybody's pain. There can be pain due to other reasons, like damage in the joints, and in those cases, we might need our orthopedic colleagues to help, and there can be sometimes braces or splints uh, and non-pharmacologic interventions. And pain medications get really tricky, as, as we're all aware of the, the concerns about chronic pain management in patients. And, and these are not always opiate-based therapies like morphine, but other types of medications can be used to treat the chronic pain of this condition. But ideally, if patients are diagnosed early and treated appropriately for their inflammation, that uh, their long-term prognosis is actually quite good. Uh, hopefully, they, they no longer have a the fear of, of wheelchairs in the future, which might be you know, the concern that parents have when their children are first diagnosed with this condition. That sounds very promising. And I also think it's good to learn that it's what we call a multidisciplinary approach where in addition to the rheumatologist, it could also possibly involve like the orthopedic specialist and also the primary care physician needs to be kept in the loop. So that's like possibly three different people that you would want to work with and make sure they're all talking to each other to manage the patient or the child most effectively. <clears throat> Absolutely. Absolutely. In many ways, I, I feel like when I, see, when I see our patients three, four, five times a year, in many ways, you feel like they're primary care doctor, but you keep everybody in the loop. Right. So where can families go to learn more about juvenile onset arthritis? Well, the first place they should go is their doctor if there's concerns about the diagnosis. Uh, and that's important because they can get plugged into a specialist and, and the resources that a specialist has. As far as websites, one has to be careful because there can be some sites out there with misinformation or, or unfortunately, some, some really scary stuff. Uh, the Arthritis, Absolutely. The Arthritis <laughs> Foundation is a good place to start. The Arthritis Foundation has a website specifically designed for children called kidsgetarthritis2.org. And that's two with T-O-O, kidsgetarthritis2.org. And also the American College of Rheumatology at rheumatology.org is a big proponent of educational materials. Okay. Do you have any final thoughts, Dr. Todd? Well, I think it's important to realize that this is a systemic condition of inflammation and autoimmunity that uh, I can't emphasize enough is is scary for parents, uh, but at the same time, if they put their trust in their doctor that the, uh, about the diagnosis and then the proper treatments, that a, a healthy balance and working carefully with their doctor and their supporting staff there, their kids can be just as wonderful, vibrant, athletically active kids as possible. That's so good to hear because I yeah. think we, we associate um, arthritis with being debilitating, and it doesn't always have to be. So thank you so That's much right. for your time today. Oh, very much pleased to be here. Thank you.